We're so glad that you could join us today for our program, and I'm going to be your guest speaker. My name is Joe May, and I preach for the Lord's Congregation at Mangrum. We would invite you to be a part of our service if possible. Our service begins on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. with Bible class, and then at 10.45 for worship. Sunday evening, we meet at 5 p.m., and on Wednesday evening, we meet at 6 p.m. We would love for you to come and be a part of our worship services, if possible. We thank you for watching us this morning. You know, there's an interesting little lake, I guess we could call it, and found over in the land where Jesus once walked its shores. It still is pretty much the same today. It is fed by the River Jordan. The River Jordan flows in and flows out of it. We know it as the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus spent so much time walking its seashores and conducting his ministries all around it and even on the sea itself. We know there was times when he taught from a boat just off the coast of that sea. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, an interesting thing occurred along the Sea now, of Galilee. Now, screen the Sea of Galilee is known photos. for its fierce storms. Because of the mountain ranges that surround it, oftentimes winds will come over the edge of those mountains and hurtle down into the sea and cause unexpected and even violent storms. Such was the case that is recorded in Mark chapter 4. A violent storm had occurred on the sea. Being 600 feet below the sea level, that was not uncommon. But when the waves thrashed and the vessel began to take on water, Jesus' disciples became fearful. It's noted that there were other vessels there pre uh, present as well. Jesus, all the while, was asleep in the hinder part of the boat. His disciples, noticing that he was asleep, went back and shook him and awakened him and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They were afraid that they were going to die. Jesus, I'm sure, must have smiled, and we know that he got up and he told the wind to cease. He calmed the winds. As he did that, the disciples were again amazed that Jesus had the power to do that. And they asked, what manner of man is this that even has power over the very elements? But Jesus wasn't finished rebuking, was he? Even though he had rebuked the winds and the winds ceased, no, then he turned to his disciples and he rebuked them and he said, Oh, ye of little faith. They had lost their faith. We find that kind of difficult today when we think about the fact that Jesus himself was in that, that ship or that boat with them. How could they have possibly been afraid when the master of ocean and sky and sea, as the song says, was there with them? But yet they were. They were human as we are, and they said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care, Jesus? Our peaceful lives today are often interrupted by storms of this life. They may be little showers sometimes that may occur when there is a cutting remark made by someone and can cause great disturbing and turmoil in our lives. But sometimes our lives are hit with full force hurricanes, if you would. That would be during the loss of a loved one or some adversity in life occurring suddenly without warning, such as an illness that we're not expecting. We either react like the disciples did, and sometimes we either react in such a way that can either make us or break us as Christians, even so. I think there are some, some lessons that we can learn from this event in Mark chapter 4. Dealing with the storms of our life, if you would. You know, every person experiences storms in their life. None of us are exempt from those. 
even those who travel with Jesus. And if you are a child of God, you know that Jesus is with you. But yet, we understand that storms come with all impartiality. In other words, just because you're a child of God, just because you're a Christian, doesn't make you exempt from the storms of life. Some leave the impression because they're a Christian that everything in their life should be smooth sailing. That's certainly not true. Christians will sometimes encounter some of the deepest and most despairing times in their life. It's how we react that's so important when those events occur. Christians do experience storms of life, as we all well know. Matthew 5 and verse 45 reminds us of that impartiality where he says, He causes the sun to rise on the evil and upon the good. He sends the rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. You see, impartiality. There is a parable in the Bible where Jesus talks about two builders. What's important is how they build. As Jesus goes about telling this parable, he said one builder built his house upon a rock. The other chose to build his house upon the sand. Then the storms came. The house on the rock, Jesus said, stood firm. But the house on the sand fell, and he said, great was the fall of it. We either have the choice in this life to build our house upon the rock, the solid foundation. Jesus is oftentimes re referred to and described as that solid foundation in which we should build our lives. If we choose to build our lives on the sand, then too, like the house that fell, great will be the fall of our lives. Being a Christian doesn't exempt us from things like cancer, as we all well know. It doesn't exempt us from the literal storms of life, such as tornadoes, and hurricanes, and floods. It doesn't exempt us from learning that maybe our child has a drug problem. That can really rock our world, so to speak. It can cause great, great storms of doubt to occur within us. Or maybe we have been to the doctor on a routine visit, and the doctor tells us, you have a tumor. And then maybe later on we find that that tumor is malignant. We only have a short time to live. That certainly can cause great storms to arise in our lives. And two, like the disciples in that boat, we may question, Lord, don't you care? Do you not care what's happening to us? Or maybe the phone rings. The voice on the other end tells us that a loved one has passed away. And we feel that storm of life approaching. How we deal with it is so important. You know what I'm talking about. In John 16 and verse 33, Jesus says, In this world you will have trouble, but he says, Take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus says he has overcome the world. He's our great example. And we know through him we can also overcome this world. In Romans 8 and verse 37, we are told that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, that is Jesus. Again, we're reminded in Philippians 4 and verse 13, where the Apostle Paul writes to the Philippian brethren and says, I can do all things through him that strengtheneth me. That's so true. With Jesus at our side, we can do all things. We can conquer all things. We can overcome all things. Remember in Mark chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus told his disciples there that with God all things are possible. Even though they may look impossible to us as men, 
yet we're reminded with God those things are possible. One man in God always makes the majority. God always makes the majority in everything, even in conquering those storms of life. We also know that Jesus is there with us, and he accompanies us, he, he accompanies us through the storms of this life, even if sometimes it may appear that he may be unconcerned. His disciples in Matthew chapter 4 certainly thought that Jesus was unconcerned about the fact that they were in the midst of a storm and, and the, they were about to die. Sometimes we're the same way. They were fear for, fearful for their lives. And they must have thought, Jesus sleeps. He's sleeping and all this is happening. Doesn't he care? In fact, they ask. Master, care us not that, that, that we perish? Sometimes we answer that, we ask that same question. We can understand their reaction. Of course, we're human like they are. When storms hit your life, do you, do you ask the same? Jesus, do you care? Aren't you concerned about what's happening in my life? Do you not care for my suffering? Do you not care about my grief? Do you not care about the troubles and trials that I'm encountering? Of course Jesus cares. Oh yes, as the song says, oh yes he cares. My, his heart is touched with my grief, the song says. We know that he does care. God really cares. I had a troubling statement come one time from a friend that I, it just totally caught me unexpected. And he said, you know, based on everything that's happening in my life right now, I've come to the conclusion that either God doesn't exist at all or he doesn't care. That's a very troubling statement, especially coming from one who claimed to be a Christian and a follower of Christ. You know, when we look back on the account of Mark chapter 4, we realize that Jesus wasn't asleep because of not caring. He was asleep because of lack of request. He wanted his disciples to ask him to help. Just as in Mark, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, where Jesus says, Ask and it will be given unto you. He wants us to ask. He said if we ask, it will be given unto us. Maybe sometimes those difficulties that we're going through is simply because we are failing to ask God for his help and direction. Sometimes maybe it's because when we ask, we want things to go our way. We want it to go like we have planned when we ask. We should always ask that it will be done in God's way. That his will will always be done because it will. We're not promised exemption from trouble. We are promised, however, protection during these times of trouble. The psalmist in Psalm 27, verses 1 through 4, writes that, Of whom shall I be afraid? He's talking about in these times of trouble. Of whom shall I be afraid? When these things beset me, he realized that with God, he shouldn't be afraid to face these things. In Romans 8 and verse 31, the Roman writer says, If God be for us, who can be against us? That's so true. With God at our side, we can conquer all. We can face all. We can overcome all with him there. Maturity comes when we endure these storms. You know, just as the scripture tells us that sometimes by enduring these storms of life that it builds patience. James talks about that in the book of James. And that helps us to overcome. The storms of life can strengthen us. The disciples in the storm of life that they faced they saw the deity of Jesus through it all. What manner of man is this that controls the very elements? 
they saw the deity of Jesus. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James says, Count it all joy when you fall into all divers temptations or various forms of temptation, knowing that those, th those trials, those temptations, will help to work patience in your life. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. Think about this. Think about this seriously. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, the early disciples, when they faced adversity, when they faced persecution and trials, what does the scripture say happened as a, as a result of that? Well, it says in Acts 8 and verse 4 that when they faced those trials and those adversities and those persecutions, they were scattered abroad and they went everywhere preaching Jesus. It strengthened them, you see, and only made their resolution stronger to preach the word and spread that word of Christ, and they did. Sometimes we can only see things in retrospect in this life. By that I mean we can only see sometimes those things that are or have been done. Realizing that God is still working in our life, that He's going to be there with us as long as we're faithful and we, we walk with Him, He will walk with us. I remember seeing the poem several years ago, Footprints in the Sand, where the author is talking about having a dream and, and he dreamed in his dream that God was walking with him along a seashore and he would see those, those four footprints in the sand, two of God's and, and two of his. But he, he realized that in the most difficult times in his life, as he looked at the footprints, he only saw one set of prints. And he asked the question, where were you, God, when I needed you worse? Where were you at in my life when I needed you worse? To that, God replied, those were the times that I carried you. You see, that one set of footprints was God's, not his. That was God carrying through those difficult times in life. In Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21, we read where Joseph had just uh, again got to meet his brothers who had betrayed him and had sold him into slavery. And when they found out who he was, they were fearful of what he might do to them. But yet Joseph told them to not fear. He said, for I will sustain you. I'll take care of you. He had forgiven them and they were again reunited. We don't oftentimes see God's care until we look back over the years. And then sometimes we realize that God was there in times when we didn't think that He was. In times that we didn't think that He cared. He was there watching over us, protecting us, and guiding us. Have you ever looked back and many years ago you realized that you had prayed to God for something and you didn't get what you'd ask? And you probably question, did God really hear my prayer? Well, if you were faithful, of course he heard your prayer. But maybe you realize, looking back over the years, and you see that what you asked for would not have been the best thing for you. In fact, it could have been something that could have dramatically changed your life for the worse. And then you realize, I'm sure glad that it was God's will and not mine. You see, that's how God sees things. He sees the best when only sometimes we can see the worst. He sees the best when only sometimes we can see nothing at all. But yet God sees. Romans 8 and verse 28 reminds us that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord. That's a hard scripture for some, but yet we realize it's so true that even though we can't see it now, God sees it. He knows and He cares. Yes, He does. He cares so much. In your storms, do you panic or do you trust God? He doesn't promise exemption from the storms of life, but He does promise perfect protection to those that love Him and obey His will. Remember, those storms will not last forever. 
they're but short. As this life is but short, they too are short. But we must be obedient to God's will. We must begin by hearing His Word in Romans 10 and verse 17. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. It's that Word that saves us. We know also that we must be willing to repent of our sins, just as those in cha Acts chapter 8 and, and verse 38, when they ask, I mean Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, say, ask what they must do in order to be saved. And they were told to repent and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Notice in the same chapter, in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, they were added to the church by Jesus himself. That's what we must do. And we must be faithful unto death. Romans 2 and verse 10 reminds us of that. Then we'll receive the crown. I hope that this lesson has been encouraging to you in the problems that you're facing. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you. you've enjoyed studying the Bible with us today. We look forward to joining you again next time as we study the truth of God as it is found only in the Bible. If you'd like a free DVD of today's lesson, have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, or would like a copy of the two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ, Post Office Box 2216, Jonesboro, Arkansas, 72402. Email at nettletonch at yahoo.com. at the fourth of Matthew's Gospel 
that Jesus began summoning the men who were going to be assisting him in his earthly ministry and even carrying it forth after he had ascended back into heaven. Peter, Andrew, James, and John were all four professional fishermen, and the work that the Lord was summoning them to do was important enough to warrant calling them off of their work in order to do it. Peter and Andrew are told by the Savior that they would be fishers of men. The metaphor is quite obvious, that since they had indeed been accustomed to catching fish for a living, they would now be catching men, if indeed the metaphor is going to remain consistent. As fishermen, they were accustomed to catching fish that was necessary to the performance of their livelihood and to be able to make a living at it. Therefore, if the metaphor is going to be consistent, that they were going to be fishers, then catching some is absolutely necessary. It should be noted, though, that not all men who are called by the gospel are won by the gospel. Some are so discouraged by the fact that all those with whom they speak about the word of God are not responsive to it that they quit trying to win any at all. It is actually this condition also that our Savior addressed at the fifth of Luke's Gospel when he is out on Peter's own fishing vessel and tells him to launch out into the deep where he's promised that he'll catch a great many fish. Peter doesn't seem to be particularly anxious to do what the Lord asked because he had just completed an all-nighter on Lake Genesaret without catching anything. Yet because it was the word of the Lord that told him to launch out into the deep, it would be at the word of the Lord that Peter would do that very thing. When he let down his net, he brought up so many that the volume nearly sank, not one, but two ships. It was with this that Peter fell down before the Lord and expressed his belief that he was unworthy to even be in the Lord's presence. Indeed, we should understand that not only redemption is by grace, but it is an equally gracious gesture on the Lord's part to give us the opportunity and the privilege to even be of service in his kingdom. Peter seemed to understand that very thing. But yet while we understand the privilege of not only being saved, but serving in the kingdom, we might still become discouraged when we feel that our efforts have really not accomplished as much as we would like to see them accomplish. But then on the other hand, Peter could not see the multitude of fish in his submerged net until he brought it up and he saw just how great a harvest had been supplied by the Savior who promised it. Similarly speaking, you and I may never really be aware of the good that we are doing in every case where we try to do that good. But nonetheless, it remains our privilege to serve in the kingdom. It remains the prerogative of those with whom we share the word to do with it what they will, and it remains the prerogative of our Savior to bless our effort to the degree that he will. But it should also be pointed out that at any rate, the effectiveness of the gospel is significantly enhanced when those with whom we share it can detect in us 
that we believe it as much as we are calling upon them to believe it, that we obey it as much as we are calling upon them to obey it. In the Mosaic age, that law was given unto Israel for them to be stewards of it. When we came to the Christian age, it would again be unto the children of Israel to whom the gospel would first be preached and then it would spread out into the uttermost parts of the earth. Peter himself made the observation that judgment begins at home. If we're concerned about the number of those proverbial fish and our spiritual net being a volume significantly less than we would like for it to be, then understand this about they who would fish. They have to know how. And if it's the gospel that you are seeking to share with someone, that someone needs to see that gospel in you. It's then that that metaphor of being a fisher of men is going to become more meaningful. There's a happy land of promise over in the great beyond where the Savior bears shall soon the glory share where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore everybody will be happy over there everybody will be happy over there will be happy will be happy over there we will show Selected. Selected.